In January 2015, the first State of the Bay Research Symposium was held at the Alaska Ferry Terminal on Bellingham Bay. The purpose of the all-day event was to enhance communication and coordination between various agencies, organizations, and citizens involved in the protection of Bellingham Bay. The symposium brought together researchers, managers, and interested citizens who are all connected to the future of the Bay. The symposium featured seven distinct topics, including Bellingham Bay yesterday and today, local key issues, challenges, and research needs, physical processes, chemistry and water quality, biological ecosystems, regional research perspectives, and moving forward with limited funding. We will present the State of the Bay Symposium in seven parts. This is part five, biological ecosystems. All right, everyone. Welcome to the biological. Could, could you use the mic, please? <laughs> yep. My voice sounds so loud to me. Can everyone hear me? Can you guys hear me? Um, so we're going to move on now. We've talked a lot about physical processes, water quality, chemical processes. Now what I want to do is pull all of this together and talk about um, the biological components and the ecological processes that sort of live within the context of these physical and chemical processes that we've uh, heard about today. Um, I'll give a quick overview of providing some context, and then I'll talk a little bit about the work I'm doing in Bellingham Bay, and then introduce the speakers and the content that each of them is going to talk about. So this schematic is taken from the um, Gulf of Mexico Dissolved Oxygen Program, um, although it is really applicable here to Bellingham Bay and the Salish Sea. Just to orient you, I'm going to use this cartoon to represent Bellingham Bay. So over here we have, um, over here we have the freshwater input, which we can treat as the Nooksack River. Um, Nooksack River flows into Bellingham Bay. I'm losing my battery on my pointer. Nooksack River flows into Bellingham Bay, and with it we have um, it brings nutrients that come from both freshwater inputs overland flow, stormwater, as well as inputs from upwelling. And these come in to combine fueling a highly productive ecosystem of the Salish Sea and specifically um, Bellingham Bay, which a lot of the eyes over Puget Sound photographs you've seen a testament to the amount of productivity that we have here. Um, so we have this, um, this ecosystem setting. We have phytoplankton production, which is a big part of the ecosystem here that drives productivity and the food webs um, and marine food chains that we'll look at. Phytoplankton, as they grow and are highly productive, is valuable for our food webs, but then as excess phytoplankton, specifically in the form of phytoplankton blooms, as that sinks to the bottom, in, uh, as you see here, that starts to decompose and it draws down oxygen. And one of the concerns that we have in the Salish Sea, and specifically in Bellingham Bay and some of the work that I'll talk about, is how does export of organic matter to deep waters fuel hypoxia and low dissolved oxygen? Um, one of the other important components of Bellingham Bay and, and all coastal ecosystems is the near shore and specifically the intertidal communities. Um, and these are the organisms that, um, such as seagrass beds and the rocky intertidal, that um, are, um, are a part of the near shore, provide habitat for a lot of the fish that we're interested in, commercially viable species. Um, and then, of course, we have, as a microbial ecologist, what I call our charismatic megafauna. Um, fish, salmon, and these larger macroorganisms that we will hear more about today. Um, so let me just tell you what the four speakers that we have today, what we're going to cover. I will talk a little bit about dissolved oxygen study that is going on here in Bellingham Bay and some of the work that we've done along with Western and Northwest Indian College. Um, um, we will move into the intertidal and the near shore, and I've got two of our panelists today, um, Dr. Mark Dr. Marco Hatch from Northwest Indian College, who's going to talk about seagrass in Portage Bay. And then Ben Miner from Western Washington University is going to talk about sea star wasting disease. Um, and then finally, looking at the near shore habitat and um, salmon, Eric Beamer will, will share some information on near shore habitat um, for, for uh, juvenile salmon. So we're going to start out, let's take a look at 
um, the microbial processes that are fueling um, low dissolved oxygen and some of the work that we've done in Bellingham Bay addressing this question. Before I start out, I want to make sure everyone um, recognizes that this work that I'll talk about over the past oh, five or six years has been a result of a bunch of cobbled together funding. Um, and it has come from a number of different sources. Uh, the USDA through Tribal College's research grant program at Northwest Indian College, some, more, some fundings from NSF, um, fundings from uh, Shannon Point Marine Center, as well as Western Washington University. Um, so I'm gonna, there are two goals of the study that we've been working on that I'm gonna share with you today. One is to identify the spatial and temporal extent of low dissolved oxygen in Bellingham Bay. And then the second is to look at and investigate what some of the drivers of that low dissolved oxygen is. And I'm gonna sort of take you through a little walk through history over the past several years of where this study has brought us, where we started and where we are today, and then some of the drivers that we've been looking at. Um, I started working with Northwest Indian College back in 2007 uh, working with students who are interested in this, in this question, a picture here is Jason Sieber, one of the students I worked with, who is also a fisherman and was really concerned about evidence of low dissolved oxygen that he was seeing in Bellingham Bay. And he really was the first one to ask this question uh, among the students at Northwest Indian College that started this whole monitoring program. Um, as we moved forward, our first question was, what are the dynamics of low dissolved oxygen in Bellingham Bay? Um, a couple of years later, a student from Northwest Indian College, again, Lance Brocky, worked with me to monitor specific sites in the center of Bellingham Bay and tracking low dissolved oxygen or dissolved oxygen concentrations in the bottom. And this is a figure from his final presentation showing that if you start in July, uh, July 1st on the, um, I'm turning myself around, the left, <laughs> the left side of the axis, for your perspective. As you go through the summer, what we've characteristically seen in that year and every year since is that starting in July and moving on into August and September, we tend to see this predictable decline in dissolved oxygen concentrations. And this is something that characteristically we see in any system that experiences hypoxia throughout most of the estuarine systems. That as you start to load organic matter and productivity increases, algal productivity, things sink to the bottom, and that decomposition drives that lower dissolved oxygen. So this is a pattern that we, we know now is pretty predictable in Bellingham Bay. That pattern that we saw prompted us the next year to follow up with some work by an intern who worked with me, who just recently graduated from Western Washington University, to do high resolution transects in Bellingham Bay. And so these red uh, station sites that you see here are where we went out and did CTD profiles. We lowered instrumentation into the water, measured dissolved oxygen concentrations, temperature, salinity at each one of those points several times throughout the summer. So we were able to generate more high resolution mapping of the extent of dissolved oxygen over the summer in Bellingham Bay. I'll take you through these three different figures, but the take home message from that first, that particular summer of work is that um, hypoxic water, bottom waters occur, and they're, they're predictable in a certain area, uh, area. And Christopher Krems showed this first figure here that you see on the left. This is one of the figures. It's a contour plot representing the lowest levels of dissolved oxygen in bottom waters that was generated from Sarah's work. Um, and since that summer, we've been able to predictably see this, this region of low dissolved oxygen in Bellingham Bay. It surprised us because if you look at some of the LIDAR image, and you've seen images like this from Eric this morning, um, this LIDAR image, this low dissolved oxygen is not happening in the deepest part of Bellingham Bay, which is the characteristic place that you find low dissolved oxygen. Rather, um, let's jump over to one more figure, and I'm sure this has been updated by Bert and Elizabeth. I don't know, they've done some new work on residence time in Bellingham Bay. But we find that the low dissolved oxygen, not surprisingly, is occurring in this region of, low, of longest residence time. So the water sits, organic matter decomposes, and it draws down the oxygen uh, concentrations. Um, Sarah did some calculations based on our three-dimensional estimates of this and found that the volume of low dissolved oxygen that's lower than four milligrams per liter is equivalent to about 14,000 Olympic swimming pools. Um, so a lot of dissolved oxygen, a lot of low dissolved oxygen water in there. Um, but one of the things that we noticed in that summer and then in the following summer with an, another student that worked with me was that there's, even though there's this predictable body of low dissolved oxygen water in the bottom of Bellingham Bay 
Um, there, we get these excursions, and somebody long ago called these snarks, these little parcels of low dissolved oxygen water that pass up into the water column. Um, we started seeing those. And so what you have here is a, a side profile of Bellingham Bay. The vertical axis is depth. And then along the bottom is distance along a transect running from the southern part of Bellingham Bay to the northern part. And colors represent concentrations of dissolved oxygen. And what we saw is um, early, we saw low dissolved oxygen concentrations only in bottom waters where we found them before. But as we started to sample more frequently, we found these parcels of water that were moving up into the water column. And we noticed that once or twice in the first year. And it became a question that we wanted to pursue a little further. Um, so what we did is last, no, it was this past summer, we built a subsurface sensor array and deployed um, this in a couple of locations in Bellingham Bay. Each one of the white boxes represents a sensor that's measuring dissolved oxygen, temperature, and salinity. Um, there's a subsurface float that's about 10 meters below the surface because we need to put this out long term and we can't interfere with navigation or boats or having our instruments dragged off. Um, so we deployed the sensor for a series of two week periods to see what is happening with this low dissolved oxygen, evidence of this water moving up and down. Just the picture to the left shows you what one of the housing looks like and then the rat nest of, of cable and coil that you bring up when you have to pull these instruments out of the water. This is Natasha Chrisman who's here today as well and has worked with me on this project for a couple of years. Um, so this. This figure shows the data that has come off of one of these sensors um, that was deployed in the beginning of, we don't have another laser printer pointer, do we? Um, if you can dig one up for, uh, yeah. for the rust ones. I can walk up, but I don't want to step away from the microphone. So I'll just take you through this. Deployment started on the 25th of June, moved on to the 25th of July. I've superimposed over there the tidal cycle, which we predicted that a lot of the, the snarks, these parcels of low DO water moving into the water column were driven by tidal exchange. Oh, awesome. Thank you. The blue is low dissolved oxygen or dissolved oxygen concentrations in the water column. And what I would just want to point out is that as we go through the, the spring tides and this big flushing that occurs in Bellingham Bay, there's this turnover event or something that's going on. And Tarang is the person that I should be talking to about this and looking at this with the model predictions that are similar but also different than this dissolved oxygen concentrations. What is going on here in terms of the small scale mixing that is bringing these parcels of low dissolved oxygen, sometimes ex uh, excursions that are lower than two milligrams per liter, up into the water column? Um, so this let us know that the dynamics of dissolved oxygen are way different than we expected. You anticipate that they sit on the bottom and they stay there and it's not a concern. But as we see evidence of it lifting up into the water column, it makes us think about what is the influence of this in, um, other, uh, in other ecological processes and organisms in the water column. So just to recap on that, um, uh, low DO is predictable every summer, decreasing from June to September. It tends to occur in the same place of Bellingham Bay. Um, with work that I'll talk about in a second, it's driven by degradation of organic matter. Um, despite the predictability of these d low DO concentrations in the bottom water, it's highly variable with this movement up and down in the water column. And it appears to be related to some kind of turnover that's happening with, um, with low DO water in the water column. The next thing that I want to um, talk about is the drivers of low dissolved oxygen. And I'm going to quickly march through these in the interest of time and getting our other panelists up here. Um, just a recap on this particular figure. There are three things that you need to take place in order for uh, hypoxia to occur. We need stratification, which uh, Christopher mentioned a little bit earlier, so that there's no exchange of air from the surface into deep waters. You need organic matter, whether it's from land or phytoplankton sinking. And then we need decomposition of that organic matter so that it consumes uh, oxygen. And these three things together drive hypoxia in any system, in particular Bellingham Bay. Um, last uh, summer, I had a student analyze data from um, most of the year, from June all the way into um, January of 2014, showing that stratification, this is stratification index, stratification is highest in the summer, lowest, low stratification that's well mixed in the winter, but then during Spring tide events, there tends to be an erosion of that stratification. But in general, we get more hypoxia when the water column is, is more stratified. 
The other thing we wanted to look at is how does dissolved, how does dissolved oxygen respond to sinking organic matter? And here is this blow up of phytoplankton production in the upper water column, sinks to the bottom, decomposes, and draws down organic, uh, draws down dissolved oxygen. We did a number of laboratory experiments where we brought deep water back into the lab, incubated it with um, amendments of temperature or dissolved, uh, dissolved organic matter to see if indeed this deep water is ready to respond to organic matter. So if we have a phytoplankton bloom and all the organic matter sinks, um, if, if the microbes there are not hungry for organic matter, it won't drive hypoxia. So we need to first predict that if we export organic matter, would it draw down oxygen? And indeed, when you, um, when you supplement this water with dissolved organic matter or carbon from phytoplankton, respiration ramps up, which means oxygen concentrations decrease. This evidence of organic matter sinking to the bottom, drawing down oxygen concentrations, was reflected in some field data that we looked at. Um, this is some work that I did with Robin Codner, one of the faculty members at Western, um, and Sierra, a student that worked with us, um, and Natasha as well. So we noticed a Pseudonychia bloom early, uh, earlier in the summer, um, or earlier in July. That sank to that Pseudonychia bloom sank to the bottom and then eventually dissipated. And I'm going to have you track three things here. The green is chlorophyll in the bottom water. So we see evidence of that Pseudonychia in the bottom, with then, which then dissipate dissipates. Oxygen consumption, how quickly the, or, the organic matter is being respired, increased, and that caused a corresponding down draw of oxygen. So we're seeing very quick, rapid response to inputs of organic matter, which has some management implications as we think about the blooms that occur in surface waters. So just to recap on that, the stratification, it varies throughout the year. Um, and oxygen consumption, or respiration, responds quickly to organic matter. Um, which means that as we load the system with phytoplankton production or other forms of debris and organic matter, it will quickly translate into drawn down dissolve, uh, dissolved oxygen. So do we, where do we go from here? Um, I mentioned this already, and uh, Terang sort of mentioned this earlier this morning. Um, taking these in situ data and coupling it with some of the models to see if we can really reflect what is going on in these natural e ecosystems and, and with dissolved oxygen dynamics. Um, and then manage for uh, reduction of organic matter delivery to deep waters, whether it's terrestrial organic matter or phytoplankton blooms. That was my pause. That part's done. My obligatory sunset picture. Um, <laughs> so we're going to move up the food web into um, larger organisms. And there are three presenters who are going to uh, speak now as part of our panel. Um, Marco Hatch uh, is going to speak about seagrass in Portage Bay. Um, then we'll hear from Ben, who will address sea star wasting disease in Bellingham Bay and the Salish Sea. And then Eric Beamer will talk to us about juvenile Chinook salmon, assessment of the Nooksack estuary in Bellingham Bay near shore. Um, and at that, I'm going to invite Marco up here to Thank you, Jude. And um, I'd like to thank the Lummi people for allowing me to present today on their ancestral lands. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge them for <coughs> allowing me to be their collaborator and ally for the past two and a half years at Northwest Indian College. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our funders, primarily NIFA, for this work, and my co-authors. There's a few listed here, and there's a few more on each additional slide. I try to make sure that all partners are acknowledged as we move forward. <coughs> so as Jude said, I direct the Salish Sea Research Center. Um, the Salish Sea Research Center, um, our, our mission, our mandate is, like we mentioned, to train the next generation of native environmental scientists. And, and we believe in doing this, um, and we believe in science for a resilient Sal Salish Sea. And so working on projects that are applied, that are important, that will help um, our area move forward. Um, and I'm joined by two other indigenous researchers. Um, so we have an all indigenous staff at the Salish Sea Research Center. Um, Sky Augustine, whose family is from the Stipmanis First Nation on Vancouver Island. She's really interested in how traditional technologies can be used as we move forward. So looking at the ways the ancestors interacted with the land and how those practices can be implemented today to help support resilience. Um, and Rosa Hunter, who's our um, uh, staff member, 
She's from the Port Gamble Skellum tribe. Um, she's a graduate of Northwest Indian College, and she's interested in the microscopic world. You give her a microscope, and, and she's happy. And, um, so together, we work in this, this, I can't call it brand new, it's a year and a half old, but still pretty new, uh, research center at Northwest Indian College. Um, it's a 4,200 square foot marine research center located um, at the Lummi campus. Um, we have got a full lab for analytical chemistry, biology, a wet lab, uh, an ecology lab, a microscope room, a uh, mud room. We can pull our boat and truck <coughs> up behind and wash off and get loaded. It's really a beautiful facility um, that's our privilege to, to be able to work and, and, and serve it out of the center. Um, this building was funded with 81% National Science Foundation funding and 19% through ca our capital campaign um, program, which is building a whole new campus at Northwest Indian College. And so if you've not been out in the past, say, four or five years, you need to come. We look a lot different. Um, we've gone through a, we're going through a big growth phase, um, and it's quite impressive. Um, and so I personally invite any of you to come out, um, contact me or, or any of the, uh, I believe there's 11 people from Northwest Indian College here. Um, I'll have you stand up at the end, but that's a huge showing. And so we approach <coughs> research using this, this conceptual model um, that all of the research we do must have uh, these three components. Um, one is it needs to support student success. We're a small undergraduate student-centered um, institution. So all of our work must support students. <coughs> it must support science that matters. Um, and it has to have an, an aspect of partnership and, and outreach. Um, and so I'm going to talk about two projects that are focused on eelgrass um, and use this model to help describe them. We've got a variety of other research going on anywhere from um, here in the Salish Sea and then some work up in the central coast of British Columbia. But I'm just talking about our eelgrass work today. The first project I'll talk about um, was actually spawned out of a co-taught course um, that I taught with Sandy Wiley at Chavria, who's an eelgrass researcher from Friday Harbor Labs. And this course was funded by a NIFA grant. And so, because my position is primarily research, I wanted to teach, and so I wrote a grant so I could teach. Um, and together, <coughs> we co-taught a course on eelgrass where students were exposed to a variety of methods that are used to monitor and quantify eelgrass. Um, and then they used the data from, from those different methods to look at eelgrass on a landscape scale, um, using Portage Bay as our kind of field and, and lab space. And so using a local place-based example, we could bring all these different tools and technologies here and look at how they differed, um, looked at the strengths and weaknesses of different types of monitoring, and how we need to incorporate different tools into fully understanding what's happening with eelgrass in, in Portage Bay and elsewhere. And then through this course, we also increased um, STEM literacy, the um, interest of students in science, technology, um, engineering, and math. Four of the methods we used um, <coughs> was, the, was the, the good old on the ground. Uh, we had a number of transects and grids where students would go out every low tide. Um, we would count eelgrass, um, measure canopy, the length of the eelgrass, and width. And kind of note the maturity of the eelgrass um, and also any other aspects we see if there's evidence of disease. Uh, we worked with the pilot to do a flyover, so we have some low tide imagery from this, from this class. Um, and he geo referenced those data and brought them back into the class for us. And then we worked with the manufacturer of a hydroacoustic system to come out and test that system in our same area. And so, um, and the last method we used was. Um, a drone to fly over and do, do something similar on the same day as the aerial photography. So we could um, compare low level drone photography to higher level fixed wing aircraft photography. Um, and this allowed us to bring all these different tools together and really in the same space start to ask quantitative questions. How, how does the um, percent cover of eelgrass differ between different, different tools and different techniques? And this, um, two of the students from that class are here today. One, Jefferson M. has taken this up as his capstone research. Um, and so for a more in-depth analysis, I invite you to see his poster. And you'll see, I'm colorblind, but you'll see names up here and I don't know, let's call it green. Um, <coughs> those are student posters. And so anytime you see one, that's, that's your trigger to go find that student and go ask them questions. 
Um, and so the, the, the outcome of this is really going to be as we move forward and as we think about monitoring eelgrass in Bellingham Bay, we can be very quantitative and, and very deliberate about the methods that we use and make sure that they're appropriate for the scale, scope, and cost of, of the analysis that we want. Um, and, and be able to apply certain methods only in certain areas where perhaps maybe we're more concerned about disease or hydrogen sulfide, which I'll talk about in a bit. So maybe those areas um, need a different type of monitoring than the entire Bellingham Bay region. Um, next I'll talk about briefly about a small amount of hydrogen sulfide work that we've done. Um, hydrogen sulfide is, is increasingly um, being recognized um, and looked at particularly um, in this instance how it relates to eelgrass distributions. Um, hydrogen sulfide can form when you're in, under ano anoxic conditions with um, high amounts of, of organics. This graph is showing time across the bottom and percent, percent survival on the side. Plotted against that is seedling survivorship of eelgrass, of Sasta marina, under different amounts of hydrogen sulfide. And so what this shows is across the top, when there's a little bit of hydrogen sulfide in the water, the seedlings survive. As you get more hydrogen sulfide in solution, um, it, it's fatal to seedlings. Um, and that threshold, uh, there's other things that go in that threshold, but that threshold tends to be sort of on the order of greater than 50 milligrams per liter for hydrogen sulfide. Adults can survive much higher levels, um, and so it becomes an issue for recruitment. So you could have a bed, an eelgrass bed or meadow, where hydrogen sulfide's built up, and there's still eelgrass there, but you're losing your recruits. And so over time, that bed is in, in danger of, of being locally extinct. Um, so we worked with a partner of University of Washington to go out and sample um, this area in Portage Bay. Um, and it's a little, um, a little bit hard to see in, in, in these pins, but basically areas that are red and black are of concern. These aren't high values um, on the broad scale. There's higher values, say, in Fidalgo, and there's higher values around Puget Sound. Um, but these are areas where we should think about hydrogen sulfide as a potential mechanism that might limit eelgrass in the future. Um, and so it's one parameter that we're arguing should be included in monitoring plans. Um, for Portage Bay, uh, the higher hydrogen sulfide values tended to correlate with um, lower, lower depths, so uh, small kind of 10 meter wide basins where it's a little bit slower water, um, a little softer sediment potentially. And so you'll see it on the, on the kind of bottom uh, right side. Um, these are the, the higher values that, that were observed. Um, not alarming values, but values that should be monitored that in the future could potentially be limiting eelgrass. Um, but it's good to have a baseline. And again, we think it's important to be built into any monitoring that's going forward. The next project I'll, I'll talk about um, is on a little bit larger scale. We're looking at the role that healthy eelgrass beds play in reducing harmful algal blooms. So how does eelgrass help keep shellfish safe to eat? And one mechanism that we're invoking is that with eelgrass beds, um, under certain conditions, you can get production of algal-cidal bacteria. And these are bacteria that kill harmful algal species. And so if you have a lot of these bacteria, they actually kill the bad algae and allow us to eat shellfish. Um, and this is exploring the intricate interconnectedness of the Salish Sea. And this is a large collaborative project um, led of Northwest Indian College, joint with Friday Harbor Labs, um, with Northwest Fisheries Science Center, and Hokkaido University. Um, and on the bottom, you'll see a, a diagram that's showing seaweed beds and sea seagrass beds exporting algae into the bay. And these algae, again, are reducing, um, these bacteria are reducing harmful algal species, uh, preventing red tides. We're doing this work in two bays, one in Drayton Harbor and the other one in Padilla Bay. Um, we chose these bays because of the frequency of harmful algal bloom activity. That in northern Whatcom County, that's typically where we see the first harmful algal bloom events of the year. Um, and the population dynamics can push out those harmful algae and they can work their way south and impact us here. Um, 
and so we currently just finished our first field season um, where we've gone out monthly, sampled water for bacteria, sampled eelgrass for bacteria, quantified other parameters important to eelgrass. Um, and then we isolate those, those bacteria here at, at Northwest Indian College and then with our partners at Northwest Fisheries Science Center. Uh, they've developed an assay where they'll test the algal properties of these bacteria. Rosa Hunter's our lead staff on that, so she has a poster out here. Um, Aisa Yazi is worked on biotoxins, um, so she has a poster looking at the distribution of biotoxins around the Lummi Reservation that she did two summers ago. And Nick and Chrissy, um, this is Nick and Chrissy in the field, um, they looked at the relationship of bacteria and epiphytes on eelgrass um, and also the oceanographic factors that might be important to, to driving both um, epiphyte production and bacteria. Um, and they both also have posters here. Um, so I encourage you to look at those posters. Um, and one plug I want to make is, is we've talked, as we mentioned a number of times, the ecosystem value of eelgrass, the integral role eelgrass plays in the ecosystem, um, its relationship to salmon, those are all important. But eelgrass is important because it's eelgrass. Um, and I want to make sure that we keep that in our mind, um, that we keep the role of eelgrass as a traditional um, food and a traditional material um, in our mind as well. And while I apologize, this example is from Vancouver Island, I think it's, it's fitting. Um, eelgrass plants are peeled, exposing the tender, soft tissue of the leaf base. These leaves are then wrapped around the rhizome and dipped in ooligan grease, um, in, eaten as a ceremonial food. And so, um, eelgrass were consumed, eelgrass um, were used for a variety of purposes that um, we value their ecosystem service, but um, I'm a big proponent of, of eelgrass just because they're eelgrass. Um, and so I'd like to conclude um, with when it comes to setting up a, a monitoring and management plan um, for Bellingham Bay, we, we really need a collaborative effort and I, I believe this is, a, this is an amazing first step, and I really appreciate the coordination that's gone into this event. Um, and hopefully we can break out into some subgroups um, directed around habitats or species to, to discuss that. Um, the eelgrass in Bellingham Bay face multiple stressors. Um, a lot have been mentioned, um, but ones that I want to keep uh, bringing up are um, hydrogen sulfide, which, which I briefly touched on, um, some disease work that's come out of um, Cornell and um, Friday Harbor Laboratories, which I haven't spoken about. Um, but there's multiple impacts that are going to impact eelgrass um, beyond sediments. And so we need to be able to incorporate that um, into our monitoring and management schemes. And then last, um, to, to work with indigenous researchers. Um, we've, we've talked about um, a science view and we've talked about an, um, a Lummi view and a traditional view, but I want to talk about having those within one person. Um, and so with that, I'd like all the Northwest Indian College students and staff and faculty to stand up right now. So as I mentioned at my last count, there's 11 of us plus one recently retired individual. That's 12 people in a room of, was there 100, 150 of us here? Um, yeah, 10%. And our student population is, what, Emma, 500, 400? But Lummies, yeah. So there's a lot of us here, um, and we're here, and we want to be engaged. Um, we want to work together as scientific partners, um, and we're here because, because we care. And so please engage the students, um, interact with the faculty and staff that are here. Um, so with that, um, Heishka, and thank you to NIFA, Lummi, and the organizing committee. So we're, we'll wait till all the speakers are done and we will um, field questions all together. Let me just, our next speaker is Ben Miner. Ben is an associate professor in the biology department at Western Washington University. The microphone, please. Yep. <laughs> 
Ben Miner is an assistant professor at Western Washington University in the Biology Department. He investigates how the in environment influences the ecology and evolution of marine organisms. And recently, he's been studying the dramatic die-offs of sea stars in the Pacific Northwest and coastal, uh, coastal Pacific waters. So Ben, please come up. Thank you. Hey, thanks for being here today. I'll try to stand in front of the podium, which will be difficult for me. <laughs> so, um, so I want to chat with you guys about sea star wasting disease. And when Jude asked me, he told me I had 10 minutes to give my talk initially. And so I normally talk for well over an hour normally, and I can blather on for much longer than that. So I pared down my slides. So I'm going to give you a general overview um, of what's been going on. But if you have more specific questions, I'm more than happy to answer those. So here's a picture of a wasted sea star, uh, sea star. This was just taken up at Point Whitehorn here uh, during the summer. And as you probably, many people have heard, that there is this disease called sea star wasting disease, which has been causing mass mortality along the, uh, the Pacific coast of, the, of North America. Um, the numbers of stars that have died are probably reasonable estimates of hundreds of millions. Um, and I think at this point, most scientists are pretty comfortable saying that it is the largest mass mortality ever associated with the disease ever recorded. Um, so the, the event that has recently occurred is, is, is quite frightening. And, um, and some of the, uh, I think, positive things that have come out of it is, have been partnerships between scientists and, um, and citizen scientist groups and other concerned citizens helping to identify where the disease has occurred and get a better picture of its spread and where, um, where its impacts have been. So a whole bunch of people have been involved, as you might expect, with something that is uh, so widespread. Um, so I won't go through the details here, but I received some funding from NSF and also Sea Grant and Western Washington um, to help support the research that went on in my lab. So sea star wasting disease, if you're not familiar with it, it's basically just a set of symptoms. Um, until very recently, um, there was no evidence for what was causing the disease. And so it just gets described as a set of symptoms. And basically what happens is a sea star will start to develop lesions um, on the epidermis, its skin. Those lesions open up. They normally look kind of whitish, and they will, they will become larger. At some point, the, the skin actually rup ruptures, and the internal organs oftentimes spill out through these lesions, especially in the armpits. For a number of species, the arms will rip apart from the body and basically crawl away. And that's oftentimes in the, a lot of the media zombie um, uh, comments um, about the disease. Then um, individual oftentimes will lose body turgor, so it becomes kind of flaccid, starts behaving as you might expect, not normally, and then normally um, dies. Uh, this depends on the species, but typically from the time you see lesions till the time the individual is dead takes about seven days, so it's about a week. Um, and the interesting things, and one of the reasons why it's been coined wasting disease, is that once the individual dies, it deteriorates very, very quickly into this pile of goo, basically, and like that previous picture. Um, and that's probably the result of the fact that the individual has, is strongly affected by what's likely a secondary infection of bacteria that's breaking down the tissues. The individual dies, and those bacteria are already in abundance and then quickly um, break down the organic matter. So the geographic extent, um, there's, if, you, if you're really interested in kind of where observations have been made by a variety of groups, you can go to seastarwasting.org, which is a site that's hosted by UC Santa Cruz. And they've basically been collating um, and uh, accepting observations from just about anyone um, that has gone out in the field and, uh, and looked at a particular site looking specifically for sea star wasting disease. And so they just post um, all those observations on those sites, and you can see all up and down the coast, they have thousands and thousands thousands of observations that they posted. Uh, instead of trying to weed through those, what I did is I plotted up here some long-term data from um, a variety of sites up and down the coast. And these sites are monitored by a group called Marine. And they go out to rocky um, shores at low tide, and they count the organisms there. And it just happens that their target species that have, they've been monitoring at some sites for over 30 years have been sea stars. And so if you look at the plot, maybe you have the perfect. So over here, if you look at this plot here, the, um, the size of these circles are just how many individuals were estimated at the particular site, at those particular plots. And then the color indicates 
from the last five year running average, what's been the decline within the last observational period. And so you can see that at a number of sites here, we get a lot of red and that indicates that there's been strong um, decline in the population, in some cases nearly to 100%. Um, and if the populations had increased, it would have been plotted as green. Um, and you can see that there's no green along there at all. None of the populations have increased recently. They've only declined um, and the extent of the decline has been very substantial substantial around Southern California here, throughout much of Central California, throughout Oregon, and then up into Washington. And in our area here, you can see that we've been strongly affected. Now, the extent of it actually goes up much more than this, and it's been recorded all the way into Alaska and all the way down into Baja, California. Um, the good news is, is that at least recently, this may change when we sample in the fall, but there's a few spots like the outer coast of Washington, um, some uh, spots on the central coast, and a few spots down kind of uh, southern central California um, that, that show populations that are relatively large and are doing fairly well, even though the disease has been identified in all those populations, um, it doesn't look like they've been impacted um, and, and resulted in, in severe mortality. So the hope is that those populations will, um, will persist and won't be strongly affected by disease and help hopefully recover, um, allow for the populations to recover. Um, in the um, the other pattern that was interesting is that initially, um, right when people first started noticing, uh, Dr. Steve Fratkin out on the outer coast of Washington um, was one of the first people to notice um, and alert people that there, there might be some issue. He went out to his site, very oddly enough, was called Starfish Point, and noticed that there were starfish there that had these uh, lesions on them. And he's part of the marine network, and he uh, uh, contacted other his, his collaborators and let them know that they might start looking um, around there. And then about that time, a number of naturalists were starting to report divers, report pictures of you know a whole bunch of dead sea stars on the ocean bottom around the Vancouver area. And then shortly after that, this was fall 2013, 13, the Vancouver Aquarium and the Seattle Aquarium um, identified a bunch of their sea stars diving and their collectors were noticing lots of dead individuals out in the field too. Uh, Dr. Ramundi down in, uh, who's at UC Santa Cruz, had a subtitle ecology class that he was teaching, and they were out and they started noticing dead sea stars too. And at that point, the question was, well, you know, basically has the whole coast have been hit and we've just been sampling these few spots or is it really isolated to these? And there's been tons and tons of work subsequent to this, and that's actually what appears to be the case, that initially we got the Vancouver area, was hit, southern uh, uh, Puget Sound was hit around Seattle, and then down in the Monterey Bay area in California. And the areas in between there and south of there were relatively unaffected. Um, the patterns that we initially saw and subsequent to that and some other data are strongly suggest that it has nothing to do with Fu Fukushima and radiation, though that was something that was very commonly reported in the media initially. Um, and, um, but subsequent to that, we basically had a southern to northern um, flow of the die-off of the disease. So after that initial die-off of those locations, we overwintered, um, there was evidence of the disease, but then basically starting the winter of uh, 2014 last year, Southern California started to get hammered and then basically it just moved up here. Locally in this area here, right around Bellingham, um, we experienced major mortality um, during June and July of, of last year. So the, the other thing that's been remarkable about the disease is the number of species that have been affected. And so here's a list of all the species that we know that appear to have evidence of, of sea star wasting disease. And there's one species here that, as far as I can tell, doesn't appear to be too affected. And that turns out it's the slime star. And if you know what this star is, you can put it in a bucket, you can um, perturb it, and then as you pick it up, it looks like it's just basically blown its nose and there's a massive amount of snot. Um, but the diversity of sea star that we see in the Salish Sea is remarkable. We have nearly 30 species almost anywhere else in the world that you go. They have a couple, maybe up to 10 if they're really diverse. This area is unbelievable. If you like sea stars and you care about studying sea stars, this is the place to be. Um, that type of diversity also that's been affected 
is very, very broad. These sea stars, you know, many of these species diverged, you know, millions and millions of years ago. It's the equivalent of a disease basically taking out all vertebrates. So the diversity that we see within the sea stars is equivalent of that. So imagine any vertebrate that's affected by this particular disease. And that's really, really surprising. Most diseases affect a species or a few species that are closely related within the genus. Relatively, um, it's extremely rare to see a disease that's hitting such a broad, broad spectrum um, of species, and especially many that are so distantly related. So the cause of the disease, um, recently there was a paper published in PNAS, um, myself as a co-author on it, but there was a number of people. Um, they, they, the study identified that likely a virus was the cause of the disease, um, and there was a particular virus that was suggested, though the data, I, I would argue, um, for that actually being the virus is, is it's suggestive, but certainly not conclusive. Um, there's also been some suggestion that there's environmental factors that are playing a role. There's some evidence that temperature can accelerate the, um, the effects of the disease. That may be through um, increasing the metabolism of the individual or um, affecting the, the virus or the bacteria themselves. Um, and then normally the, the, it's very likely that what actually kills the individuals is a secondary infection that's likely caused from bacteria. Some of the, the um, so uh, obviously all of that is, is quite depressing. Um, to end on maybe a little bit happier note, um, the, the evidence that we might have um, a reasonable recovery is the fact that um, we've had some surprising observations in the field within the last year. One of those has been that at a number of sites, um, and this is all up and down the coast, but not at all sites, there are lots and lots of juvenile sea stars. And so there appears to be this massive recruitment event um, that is very uncharacteristic that occurred within a year or two. And these little babies are alive and they appeared to persist through the mass mortality when all the adults got hammered. And so if you just go out, one of our sites is here at Post Point, if you just went out to the beach and walked down a little bit, you could go there. Um, and if you flip over the rocks there, you're almost certain to find a bunch of little juvenile juvenile sea stars, and the hope is that these sea stars obviously survive and grow up to be adults um, and can, can um, uh, allow for quicker recovery. And then like I showed you on the previous slide, there's also some population patches, and most sea star species, but not all, free spawn, so they shoot their gametes up into the water column, the fertilization occurs there, and then little larvae swim around in the water for uh, quite a while before they settle back down. And so it's very reasonable that if you have even distantly related kind of isolated patches that they can reseed a, you know, a large swath of the coastline. Um, so those are kind of the, the hopes um, that, that we have. The, the disease for the most part seems to be um, uh, subsided mainly for the fact that it's just hammered so many populations. But we're really hoping that as we come out of winter here um, into spring that we, we don't detect um, um, any more mortality among our populations. But certainly this next spring is, is, a, is one to watch to see whether those, those populations survive. So, and with that, I think I will end. Thank you. We'll wait till questions to the end, so I guess that was inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring that slide back up in, in a little bit. All right, our final speaker for this panel is, do we to have you talk open, Eric? Eric Beamer um, is the research director at the Skagit River Cooperative. Skagit River Cooperative. <laughs> He's gonna talk about juvenile Chinook salmon assessment of the Nooksack Estuary in Bellingham Bay near shore. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Skagit River uh, System Cooperative is, of course, south of here. Um, but we represent the uh, two of the three tribes on the Skagit um, that have UNA on the Skagit. And that's uh, Swinomish Tribal Community and Soxhawatl Tribe. Um, one of my co-authors is here, Corey Green and NOAA Fisheries. And then uh, the two others, um, Alan and Evelyn, are not here. They have meetings in Portland. But um, this is a collaborative work between Lummi and, and Skagit River System Cooperative and NOAA, as well as some, um, we got our funding from City of Bellingham, um, but we also are bringing our own 
collaboration and some funding to the core, uh, projects that Corey and I are involved with um, to the table. So um, I'll just kind of crank through it. I guess I, I should say I live in Whatcom County and I grew up in Whatcom County. So while I work primarily in this gadget, I, I really relate to Bellingham and Whatcom County and the Nooksack. In fact, um, I can almost get flooded out when the Nooksack floods. Um, I live on Fish Trap Creek, so I, I see some of the fish go by my house too. So um, I, wanna, I wanna give some context to um, the, assess, the fish assessment. Um, it was mentioned earlier, Jim uh, mentioned that it was a data gap and when he did his study or his uh, restoration um, priorities uh, document. And, it, and it's, it was a data gap uh, when the Nooksack Salmon Recovery Plan was developed in 2005, sort of they used models to um, predict or to develop their recovery actions and they didn't, didn't really use any fish data for the estuary or near shore. So, so it's always been a, a goal to kind of fill that data gap. I want to give some context about how that works. And then I'm um, going to briefly describe the system, the fish that go into the system and then our data. I'm going to highlight really the year's um, data that we collected last year, although we're making use of a 10-year data set. Um, we're supposed to produce, we're supposed to understand um, with the analysis, we're supposed to look at density dependence at the population level. So that's to figure out whether or not the estuary is filling up with uh, wild Chinook salmon and how that may be important or not to changing the recovery plan um, actions. And then uh, we're also looking at how the fish perform in the estuarine and nearshore habitats and that's with bioenergetics. So I'll touch on those two things. Um, but those are really works in progress. And then uh, give you some take homes and tell, us, tell you a little bit about what we're supposed to, what we're gonna be doing in the future. So I wanna start out with context. And so um, these are all slides from the Skagit cause that's mostly where I work. But basically people wanna know, have we recovered Chinook yet? Have we recovered salmon yet? And you look at the end point and it makes no sense at all. Um, here's when the recovery plans were put in place and that doesn't really help you. If you look at the inputs and outputs, so spawners should matter, and then they should produce a whole bunch of adults, some of which you can catch. If you add up all the numbers, you should be able to see the answer, right? And that's pretty typical spawner recruit curve. It makes no sense, although we, we always draw lines through the medians. Um, we calculate harvestable surplus. It's, uh, it's hard to figure out what's going on, especially when you want to know whether you're recovering or not, or if you're doing a plan and you're trying to figure out what to do that will matter. So this is my simple way of kind of arguing you have to put a lot, it's a complex situation to figure out salmon, um, and you have to put it in a pretty sophisticated tool. So this, is a, this was a 1993 article by a pretty smart guy that could communicate well. Um, he, I believe he works for NOAA uh, at this point, but. Um, he, he, just, he just illustrated things, how things connect in a really simple way. Um, so basically, it's a, a plus B equals C. You have, if you have on the top graph, declining freshwater habitat quality, and you have a dynamic ocean environment that the salmon respond to, then you end up with C, a dynamic, dynamic decline. Um, that's all well and good, but we tend to want to take our, get our answers out of context. And so if you looked at this point in time, you would declare it's terrible, sky's falling. And then if you looked at this point in time, you'd, you'd be tempted to say, you've done such a great job. Um, when really, you have a true long-term decline. So that's, that's the sort of the simple essence. Salmon are complicated, they have complicated life cycles, life histories, and you have to put a lot of moving parts together. So um, it comes down to you have recovery plant elements that, that you might want to improve habitat, a whole bunch of actions to improve habitat. You might need to, may not be able to change the ocean, but you certainly want to know how it works. So you have to have studies in place to know what predicts ocean cycles going up and down for survival. And then you need to put it all together. So, Here's the, the, the recovery, the graphic of the recovery plan tool that we used in the Skagit that put it all together. And so we populate each box and arrow 
is sort of a place where a study could go or monitoring information could be um, generated. And so in this gadget, we found that you have floods, um, floods, which are the, these happening, very varying in the basin. But depending on how big the flood, you have lower egg survival. If you have really big floods, you have low egg to fry survival. So that's important. And then we did a lot of studies in the, um, looking at um, population dynamics or density dependence. And this is the idea of if the habitat available in the system is filling up, what happens to the fish? Do they die? Do they su survive poorer? Do they move downstream? What happens? So there's all these transitions from freshwater to the estuary, from the estuary to the near shore, that these sorts of things could be happening. And then you have what's going on in the ocean. You have different indices of marine survival that occurs. This is the PDO, I think. Um, and then here's the average marine survival for those different PDOs. And so you put it all together, and that's your tool. So in the Nooksack, um, we're collaborating with Lummi and others in Y1 to do this part for Nooksack Chinook salmon. There's other studies going on. Um, there's the Salish Sea Marine Survival, and they're really trying to dock, try to understand marine survival and the factors that influence it, especially in the Salish Sea, um, to certain rivers. Nooksack's one of them, Skagit, Snohomish, Nisqually, and the others. So, um, uh, so that's how this, this, this assessment goes, fits into a bigger picture. And yes, it does have a specific Bellingham Bay shoreline component um, although that's not been fully defined yet, and I'll look to Renee wherever she is. She's supposed to tell me what that's supposed to look like here shortly. So it's not, um, it's also not as simple as that one, that one cycle diagram tool. So this is just a schematic of the, the life history type, so all the different ways a Chinook could make a living or survive to adulthood, um, branching at juvenile levels in um, the habitats that they experience. So this is written out for the Skagit, but likely these same types are possible in the Nooksack. So there's five different juvenile types and then uh, more of a stereotypical hatchery type. So juvenile wild type. We're focusing um, mostly on these three. Okay, so the system. We had uh, we, we capitalized on sites that Lummi had started sampling in 2003 and built on them, um, filling in some spatial gaps. In, in total, we have 24 sites that we sampled by beach sand from February through October, um, and again, linking this effort to past uh, Lummi efforts. And Lummi uh, runs the smolt trap, so they have the smolt, the out-migration estimates for uh, the Nooksack, which is also important, very, very important. So where could the fish come? Certainly, they could come from the uh, Nooksack River, the fish that could use the system, so live in the estuary, live in the Bellingham Bay shoreline. Um, that, that, those data are, are being cut, um, estimated or run through by the Lummi uh, analysts. And then, uh, and then they could come from the nearby rivers. Primarily, that would be the Skagit. We have evidence that that is occurring. And then there's also um, some evidence that some of the independent tribs that entered Bellingham Bay produced some juvenile fish into the system. And then there's hatchery fish from in-system and also nearby systems such as Samish. Um, so that's, that's accounting for the fish that enter the system that we and we go out and beach saying and make sense of it all, that's what we could be catching. Um, so in the, in, with respect to what we know for the hatchery fish, this is what could enter the system and basically um, for our data set 10 year period, um, we're, there's four to six million hatchery fish that are identifiable as hatchery fish entering the system. However, and, and fortunately, there used to be a problem with unidentified hatchery fish. Um, that's not really the problem anymore. And then there was uh, work from um, 2008 and 9 where we looked at uh, the origin of fish in the, in the Nooksack estuary. And those were um, primarily from the Nooksack, so Nooksack spring populations. And as well, the blue bars, um, that says South Sound Hood Canal Falls. Genetically, that looks the same as the Nooksack Falls, because that's the, the, the um, stock that they originally came from. So mostly Nooksack fish, and then that green bar later in the year, those are actually the Whidbey Basin fish, and those are mostly Skagit fish. 
Um, we've collected a bunch of fish uh, in 2014, um, but we haven't got the results back on their origin based on genetics. So that's a, sur a marine survival uh, study uh, component that we're waiting on. So our full data set is 10 years or 12 years, I believe. Um, this is what it looks like when you average everything by Bellingham Bay or Nooksack Delta. You can see there's a lot of variability. Um, we, there's over 2,000 beach saint sets to make that, over 5,000 Chinook caught. Um, and the variability is driven by habitat types. That's what we're studying. It's also driven by how big the population size are, when the fish might migrate, which is triggered somewhat by floods. And then uh, the issue of connectivity, uh, I think Eric showed the log jam, so that changes how fish move in the system. So those are all things that we have to sort through when we analyze our data. Um, 2014 is the, really the best data. It has the most sets, the best temporal coverage, um, and quite a few fish, although the means are on the low end. And it's also a little bit interesting. You can see that there was more fish in Bellingham Bay shorelines than in the estuary that year. So here's just some nutshells, uh, or uh, thumbnails, nutshells, whatever, um, from 2014. So, so juvenile salmon, they're migrating. They're transiently migrating, so they come and they go. So yeah, you see the seasonal curve. That's not really a surprise. Um, the wild fish certainly are arriving earlier than the hatchery fish. Hatchery fish are on the bottom. Uh, red bars are Bellingham Bay shoreline. Blue is Nooksack Delta. Um, and then the Bellingham Bay in this year had more higher densities of fish in the sites that we sampled. Looking just at Bellingham Bay sites and stratifying by two simplified habitat types, those habitats that are protected by wave energy, sort of lagoons and some of the deeper bays, deeper enclosed bays with, that have freshwater inputs, those had the most fish um, compared to the more open shoreline sites. And then if you look at the size of the fish, um, across the top rows, that's Bellingham Bay, marked and unmarked, marked is hatchery fish, unmarked is, is, uh, is the uh, wild fish, and uh, tidal delta is on the bottom. If I just put some grids on here, it kind of simplifies it. So basically, for the um, unmarked fish, they arrive at a small size, those fry migrants, and they arrive early in the year and then they stay there for a while and they grow. Um, the hatchery fish are arriving late and they are larger when they arrive. And the same is true with the, uh, within Bellingham Bay, looking at the two different habitat types. So um, arriving small and early, arriving large and late. Okay, habitat connectivity. So this should matter. Um, it's basically how the fish can find habitat. If you have to go further, you probably have less fish because there's dispersal, there's mortality. If you have a complex pathway, there's also can be less fish. So we put that together in the Skagit um, and found it important. We also um, are applying it to other estuaries, um, Nooksack included. So here's just the schematic of the sites getting fish to the, at least the estuary sites. Although the um, Red River and Lummi River sites, those are um, really not viable pathways. The fish that come there have to go around the peninsula. So, um, so we calculated the indice of connectivity to all the sites and applied them to, we have it matched with all our data, but we, we, I'll just show you the 2014 data. So, and you can see that it's really clear, right? I mean, you'd probably say, well, that's kind of stupid. Why are you showing that? Well, it um, it's actually makes a lot more sense when you look at it by the habitat types, because again, I said habitat types matter. Um, so if you, on the top graph, you look at the estuary sites and disconnected estuary, so the Lummi River and uh, Red River sites way around, long ways to go. Those are very low. And, uh, and then the other estuary sites, and that makes a, a logical um, exponential relationship. And then there's one site that didn't make any sense at all. That's uh, Upper Silver Creek. So we'll just ignore it, right? I'll get back to it. So in the near shore, what mattered more was the habitat. Um, so those protected lagoon areas with freshwater inputs um, tended to have more fish than the open water sites. Okay, now back to Silver Creek. So 
I looked at the data on that one because it was problematic. And it, it turns out that that has very low DOs. It has DOs of average DOs of three and four in, in March and April and into um, early May, I believe. And very few fish overall, and most of the species that we caught were very DO tolerant, things like stickleback. Um, there's also a lot of fish there that really shouldn't belong in northwest Washington streams like bass and sunfish. Um, so when you account for season, so the coming and going of the fish, and connectivity, and then look at the habitat types, it makes some sense. And what's surprising is, so this is a prediction, least square means are predictions of, of log transform Chinook abundance of, of wild fish. And um, what's interesting to me is that these uh, protected areas in Bellingham Bay with lagoons with freshwater inputs are the highest. And Actually, the lowest for 2014 was the connected estuary area. Again, this is, this is telling you what, this is what, how it organizes the fish results, the fish density results from 2014 when you take away any effect of season and any effect of connectivity. So I think that tells you that this Bellingham Bay shoreline habitats can be very important. Um, just a quick highlight on dense system level density system level density dependence. We're we're supposed to look at this in the Nook sack. These are key results, one panel results in the Skagit. What we need is um, is uh, to use the plot our density data by out migration data. So these are millions of Chinook migrating. What we don't have are um, we looked at it with the preliminary out migration data that doesn't make sense. And we're reanalyzing it with, um, with uh, uh, looking at the life history type. So that's a work that we, we'll, we'll produce later. Um, so you see in the Skagit, you have at high mount migrations, you have um, no more fish entering the delta. And you have smaller fish in the delta. And the excess ends up out in Skagit Bay. So we would expect those same sorts of things, although we don't know if the Nooksack has enough fish to have density dependence or not. So. Um, and then lastly, I'll just cut right to it. So how are the fish doing? That's really looking at bioenergetics, which is a prediction of growth, or a, a model to understand growth. And it's good to, when you're a cold-blooded fish going to the ocean, then starting out at this size, you, it's good to grow so that you survive. So um, what goes into it is temperature. Um, the prey and the energy value of the prey and the predator density. So those are all things that we measure in the habitats. And then we put it into a model to test to see what the effects are. So just very preliminary results. But what's interesting, and I think this really uh, makes sense for the 2014 data. So this is the calendar or the you know time on the x-axis and the size of fish in grams. So the fish entering in February. Um, start out the same size, but in those freshwater influenced lagoons, they tended to get bigger faster. And, and they, in the estuary zones, they actually didn't really grow. In fact, there was negative growth briefly, um, but they didn't really grow for about over a month and then they started to grow. So that tells you something about the quality of the habitat in those zones for 2014. And this is mainly driven, the, driven by temperature. And I don't know if temperature was colder this year than other years, but that's the sort of information that you can get out of bioenergetics model to, to understand the, how the fish are doing in the different habitats. So uh, the, uh, some quick take homes. There's consistently fish in the delta and bay shoreline habitats. Um, they're from the Nooksack. They're from other places too, including Skagit fish, which is one reason why I'm interested to work up here. Um, and in Bellingham Bay, I think that it's pretty, pretty established that these, um, some of these habitats are important, really important, and the fish are present in them long enough to, to get the good and the bad from whatever's in that habitat. We've had a lot of talks about some of the bad um, and that sort of thing. Um, we have to, there is, a, there is a, a population that's seeding some local areas of Bellingham Bay, Whatcom Creek, we have to account for that. Um, and then within, um, the larger system, landscape connectivity is important. And I think that really is, goes back to um, thinking about recovery actions and plans. 
you know, do, can the fish actually get to these places that you're planning? Or should some of the actions be change connectivity? Um, I think Silver Creek and the upper estuary area should be looked at further. The DOs might be an issue. Um, and then we have some things to do when we get better smolt out migration estimates. We have to update, do the density dependence, yep, and apply it. That's it. <laughs> so. All right, thank you, Eric. And I want to take um, I want to take a couple of minutes for no. All right, another round of applause for our panelists and presenters, please. You've been watching a presentation from the State of the Bay Symposium held in January 2015 in Bellingham, Washington. If you'd like to see the other six presentations from this symposium, please visit the City of Bellingham's YouTube site, www.youtube.com slash City of